for this morning, and don't let us walk away the same as we entered. Change us this morning through your word and through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 14. Mark 14. Mark is the second book in the New Testament, Matthew and then Mark. And this morning is the second sermon in our short four-part series that is quickly leading us up to Jesus' crucifixion upon a cross entitled The Final Hours. And Jesus now finds himself under the control of the Jewish leadership that arrested him in that garden of Gethsemane. And as we saw last week, took him first to Annas' house, the former high priest of the Jewish people, but who had been stripped of his power and authority by Rome. And yet the Jewish people still looked at Annas as their legitimate high priest. And so Annas' house is the place that they start in bringing Jesus under trial in order to charge him with a crime worthy of the death penalty. Now, each of the four gospel writers select and include parts of the various trials that Jesus underwent on this night. But to get the full picture, to understand where Jesus went and who tried Jesus where, you need to piece together all four gospel accounts to get a chronological progression of how this night of trials progressed. There were truly five parts to this night of trials, and we're going to look at two of them this morning, but I want to make sure at the outset you understand and have a high view understanding of how this night progressed. It all started, as we saw last week, at Annas' house, which was described for us in John 18. But for anything official to happen, because Annas wasn't the legitimate high priest of Rome, and what, or recognized by Rome, he sent Jesus still bound to Caiaphas, his son-in-law who was serving as the high priest that year. And Caiaphas gathered together the the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes that together made up the Sanhedrin, the highest governing authority over the Jewish people, which we're going to look at the second part of this trial in Mark 14 this morning. And once that council declared that Jesus was guilty, they then sent him to the uh, Roman governor over the Judean region, Pontius Pilate, which is the third part of this trial. And we're going to look at this section this morning as well as Pontius Pilate actually declares that Jesus is innocent of all the charges that were being brought against him. In the fourth part of this trial, Pontius Pilate, once he learns that Jesus is from Galilee, sends Jesus to Herod, because Herod was to legally preside over all the cases of those who were from the Galilean region in the northern part of the country, as Pilate sought to alleviate the pressure that the Sanhedrin was putting upon him to condemn this innocent man to death. But in Luke 23, after Herod had received no answers from Jesus upon questioning him, he sends Jesus back to Pilate, who then in the fifth and final part of this trial, which we'll look at next week in John 19, Pilate gives into the pressure and hands Jesus over to be crucified. It was a night of trial that lasted well into the morning hours of Friday. But remember how the Passover technically started after sundown Thursday evening and so runs all day Friday until sundown Friday night. So that as Jesus is led out from this unjust and cruel trial and then crucified upon a Roman cross on Friday on Passover, we see the literal fulfillment of all that that Passover pointed us towards. As the Apostle Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And this morning, we'll look at the second and third parts of this trial. And so now, as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says, wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me. As we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, we're going to start in Mark 14, verse 53. And then after we read this section, we're going to skip ahead two books to the book of John 18. Verse 53, they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. 
Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days we'll build another, not made by man. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Turn ahead two books with me, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 18. John 18, and we're going to pick up the reading in verse 28. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him and, ju and, take him and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Do you think I am a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your own people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world to testify to truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. And this is God's holy and infallible word for us today. Let's pray. Father, as the rains fall from heaven and so accomplish the purpose for which you sent them, so shall your word go forth and not return to you void, but it will accomplish every purpose for which you have sent it. So use your word to do all that you desire in us today. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. Fortunately, I've only had the experience of stepping inside of a courtroom one time. I had received a speeding ticket, and the officer told me that if I appeared before the judge and pleaded for leniency, they would recategorize the ticket as a non-moving violation, thereby increasing the fee substantially, but removing the points, which as we all know, is crucial to keeping our insurance rates low. I had been told that if I showed up, this was all but certain to happen, and yet I can remember just how anxious and nervous I was as I entered that courtroom, as I saw that judge, as I listened to the attorneys arguing the case that preceded mine. And I can remember I was sweating like crazy, even with a known outcome. And worst case scenario, if they changed their mind and went back on it, all that would happen is I would get two points and higher insurance costs. I wasn't at risk of going to prison. I wasn't at risk of losing my life savings. And yet the weightiness of that courtroom was heavy the moment I entered. You walk in that room and you cannot escape just how significant the decisions are that are made in that room. Someone's entire future literally lies within the hands of that judge or that jury to convict or acquit, acquit the person that is being charged. 
Now that courtroom and those who play important parts within it are all important parts of our justice system. And while a free society depends upon a justice system working well for all people all of the time, the reality is we know that at times mistakes are made. That while justice is to be blind, at times it cracks open an eye and takes a peek. That at times judges and juries make mistakes, and at times injustice is what happens at the end of a legal process. There was a a movie released in 2019 called Just Mercy, and it tells the story of a inmate on death row, Thomas Mc, or Walter McMillan, who in 1987 was wrongly charged with murder and convicted and sentenced to death in the state of Alabama. Until then, young lawyer Brian Stevenson takes on the case, and after presenting overwhelming evidence that had been available to everyone the entire time, he got a jury to overturn his wrongful conviction. I remember watching that movie and just feeling such anger at how unjust that system had been and how it had failed an innocent man by convicting him of guilt. Even in the best justice systems, at times, the innocent are declared guilty and the guilty are declared innocent. But on this night, as Jesus is taken before Annas, before the Sanhedrin, before Pontius Pilate, And before Herod, never in the history of mankind have we seen a greater injustice committed. As the sinless God-man gets slapped across the face, has false witnesses appear to bring false testimony, is accused of blasphemy even though his whole life had proven that he was God is declared by Pilate to be innocent and yet still handed over to be brutally beaten and then submitted to be crucified upon a cross. The worst type of death imaginable. Everywhere you looked on this night, injustice reigned. And yet none of it was accidental. None of it was unforeseen. Every evil that was committed against Jesus on this night fulfilled every word that Jesus had spoken about how it was that he was going to die. And so what we want to see in our text this morning is that because everyone involved wanted Jesus killed for their own reasons, we must see why it is that Jesus let it happen and then fall on our knees in worship. We'll develop this by seeing first the reason why the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. Second, we'll see the reason the Romans wanted to kill Jesus. And then third, we'll see the reason that Jesus willingly died. And so first, let's see the reason that the Jews killed Jesus. See, each party on this night had their own motivations, but without a doubt, the driving force behind it all was the leadership of the Jewish people. Jesus entered that courtroom of Caiaphas, who had gathered together the elders and the chief priests and the scribes that together make up the Sanhedrin, the highest governing council for the Jewish people. But they could not simply willy-nilly convict him of a crime and put him to death. Jewish law demanded that multiple witnesses appear to corroborate the charges being levied against a person. That comes from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 19.15, that says this, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. They operated by these guards against injustice, and yet they wanted Jesus killed. So they had to find witnesses who were willing to testify against him. The problem was they couldn't. And so they resorted to finding those who were willing to lie, but this too proved to be problematic. Mark 14, 56. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And yet even in the midst of all this false testimony, the high priest stands up and demands that Jesus give an account for these charges that were being levied against him, but Jesus would not. See, silence 
was the common response of Jesus on this night. As it was foretold in the great messianic prophecy of Isaiah 53, 7, which says this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. But while Jesus would not respond to those false accusations, when the high priest asks him this question in verse 61, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus leaves his silence behind. He seals his fate as he testifies to the truth of who he is. Verse 62, and Jesus said, I am. And over the last two weeks, we've seen just how significant those two words, I am, truly are. For they identify Jesus with God himself, the great I am who gave his personal name to Moses before sending him along to Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh that the great I am has sent you. But Jesus doesn't stop there. No, with his fate sealed, he just starts piling on with these words. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, any Jew of that day would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about as he was quoting from the great messianic prophecy of Daniel 7 that portrays the Messiah who was to come, who was to be sent by God himself. Listen to these words from Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now I can't unpack that passage for us this morning. But I hope you can see in there the covenant promises that were given to Abraham, a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, and the covenant promises that were given to David, a kingdom that would never end, all of which gets fulfilled in the one who was to come riding on the clouds of heaven, who would be like a son of man to which Jesus proclaims to the council on that night, I am he. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the one through whom all those covenant promises get fulfilled. I am your God. And hence, we see the high priest tear his clothes and cry out, blasphemy. Friends, Jesus wasn't put to death because he was misunderstood. They knew exactly who Jesus was claiming to be. Jesus was put to death by the Jewish people because Jesus claimed that he was God. There's no question of greater importance for you to answer in this lifetime than this. Who do you say that Jesus is? Do you align yourself with the answer that he gave on this night? Do you agree with his claims to deity? Do you understand that while, yes, he is human, just like us, he is also truly divine, God in the flesh, and therefore worthy of your whole life, worthy of your heart, worthy of your obedience, and your affections, worthy of it all. You cannot claim that Jesus was just a good man, a good teacher, a moral example for us to follow, because if that's all he is while claiming to be God, then he's either a liar who knew he wasn't God but tried to get a bunch of people to follow him falsely, or he's a lunatic, thinking he's God when he's not. But I hope you'll join with me this morning in proclaiming he's neither of those things. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. No, he is the Lord. And when the Lord shows up, the only proper response for us is to worship and to surrender all that we have to him. 
Second this morning, let's see the reason that the Romans killed Jesus. After the Jewish council condemned Jesus as deserving death, They then took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and the reason was because they didn't have the authority to execute the death penalty. Rome had stripped Jewish law from having that power so that they had to bring him before Pontius Pilate to get him to sign off on this execution. And so Pilate asked them in verse 29, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they clearly believed that Pilate was just going to rubber stamp their request on this night because they don't even give him a reason. They just say this in verse 30. If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Just trust us. But for whatever reason, Pilate was not in a rubber stamping mood on this morning. And he told them to take Jesus back and try him under their own law, which gets them to reveal what they're after ultimately. Verse 31. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Whoa, death. That's the ultimate penalty. And so Pilate brings Jesus into his headquarters for questioning. And he asks him in verse 33, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus wants Pilate as well as all of us who in the future would read the account of the trials on this night to understand that yes, Jesus is who they say that he is, but no, he is not who they think that he is. Meaning yes, he's a king just like they said, but no, he's not the type of king that they think. For Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world. Jesus wasn't concerned with taking over the temple. He wasn't concerned with overthrowing the Roman occupation. If that's what Jesus is about, he says, his disciples would have fought to prevent him being arrested by the Jews. And actually, Peter did start to do that, but Jesus put an end to it. Because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. The reason Jesus came into this world and brought his kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that derives its origin from heaven, that derives its power and authority from God himself, Jesus came to testify to truth. Jesus answers Pilate, yes, I am a king, but no, I have not come to overthrow your government or your nation or to force people to submit to my reign and rule. I have come so that you might understand the truth about what is going on in this broken world. I have come to testify to truth, truth about who God is, truth about the condition of the human heart and soul, truth about why this world is in the shape that it is, broken with injustice and power systems and abuse and self-righteousness. And it's all going to come to a head when you see my body hung upon a tree. And you get to see what it looks like when justice and mercy embrace when sin against God receives its proper penalty, but when those who deserve that penalty get pardoned instead. I came into this world so that you might see truth, for I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To which Pilate responds with words that so perfectly reflect our current world. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? Friends, the kingdom of this world operates by two principles. Pragmatism, a willingness to do whatever it takes to get your desired results, and relativism. The rejection of absolute truth and the belief that you can determine what is true for you. And those two things on this night led Pilate to submit to the pressure from the Sanhedrin. Even though he had declared already in verse 38, I find no guilt in him. But see, justice is always undermined when relativism and pragmatism rule the day because Pilate knew that it would be expedient for one man, even an innocent man, to die rather than to have these Jewish people continue to come and yell and bang on his door and demand that a guilty person from their system be put to death. 
See, the Romans killed Jesus because they rejected absolute truth. And they chose the path that would lead to their desired results, peace, calm, order, thereby hanging the truth upon a tree. So many people walk through this life and think about God and ultimate questions in the same pragmatic, relativistic sort of way today. I could never believe in a God who judges sin, a God of wrath. I could never believe in a God who allows evil to happen in his world. I could never believe in a God who limits who I could be or be with or do with my time, my body, my money, my life. See, rather than believing that God has made us in him is In his image, we are continually tempted to mold and shape God into our image. To get him to be what we want and to do what we want. We are just as tempted today to walk in relativism and pragmatism, but that will always result in the death of truth. And we will fail to see and understand who God truly is. It might feel better for a moment, but friends, remember, the man that was hung on that tree, he did not stay there. No, three days later, he rose back to life, and he has told us that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. So seek truth. Seek truth and seek to walk in its ways. Finally and briefly this morning, let's see the reason that Jesus willingly died. Lest you think the Jewish council who killed Jesus for blasphemy or the Roman governor who killed Jesus for pragmatic reasons were the ones sovereignly in control of the events that happened on this night, let me read for you Jesus' own words to his disciples from back in Matthew chapter 20. He said this, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, Pilate and Herod, to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Now, the resurrection has not yet happened at this point, but everything else that Jesus said would happen in Matthew 20 literally happens on this night of trials, just as he said. Jesus called his shot, and he nailed. And the reason that Jesus knew all that was going to happen was because this was the plan that he and his father had set forth from eternity past for how he was going to fulfill every covenant promise that God had made for how he was going to redeem and save a sinful people unto himself. Yes, the Jewish council acted unjustly. Yes, Pontius Pilate acted cowardly. Yes, Herod treated Jesus shamefully. They were all guilty of great sin against God on this night. But Acts 4.27 makes this clear. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand And your plan had predestined to take place. See, there's no doubt that everyone conspired against Jesus in order to unjustly put to death this sinless and innocent man. And yet Isaiah 53 proclaims as clearly as any other text in Scripture that all of this was part of God's will. And God's purpose. Listen to verse 10 from Isaiah 53. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offering, offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. There's no doubt the world hated Jesus and wanted him killed. But the reason that Jesus died, the reason that Jesus submitted to all the injustice on this night was to fulfill God's plan of redemption so that out of his anguish as the righteous one, the many unrighteous would now be counted as righteous. That king whose kingdom is not of this world, it's not a kingdom of money and power and rank. No, this kingdom's victory comes as the king himself lays down his life on a cross to take the price and pay the price for all those who would put their faith and trust in him before he came and died and who are now putting their faith and trust in him after he came and died and rose so that he might take our punishment upon himself and so that we might be saved. Friends, all of this, it's not about just being good people. It's not about just looking put together in the eyes of others. It's not about just raising kids who are decent, moral human beings. All of this is about seeking and understanding truth. The truth that our sin against a holy and righteous God makes us worthy of death and eternal life separated from him. And yet out of God's great love for us, While we were yet sinners, Christ came and he lived that sinless life that we could not and then he laid that life down on a cross so that he might bear our sin and punishment and so that we might be declared righteous. Friends, look at all that Jesus has gone through to make you his own. And we now cling to and bow down to and surrender all that we have to him as our Savior, as our Lord, and as our God, for he is worthy of it all. And so if you have not done that this morning, today could be the day of your salvation. Repent of your sin against God and trust in what Jesus has done so that all of his work might be counted as yours and so that you might be with God again. Let's pray. Father, we are blown away at this display of your power, of your love, of your mercy, of your justice and your grace that all meet and embrace at the cross. Though many on that night shouted, crucify, crucify, that many on that night declared you guilty of blasphemy. None of that was outside of your control, and you designed it all so that your sheep, your people could be redeemed. Praise be to God and to the Lamb who died in our place. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.